Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here in room six, and I hope you are too. Uh, welcome to Teaching That Make It Pretty. I'm Erica Aguirre. I teach history, social science for ABC Unified School District. I'm currently split between two schools, um, seventh grade history and um, 11th grade history. So I teach at Ross Middle School and Gar High School. Um, I actually teach in the same district as Angela, so it's really nice that she's my moderator today. I'm excited for that. Um, you can follow me at EdTech and Style on Twitter as well as Instagram. And again, welcome. I'd love to know where you guys are from, and I wish we had like, you know, like not a condensed time frame, but um, go ahead and drop it into the chat where you're from. Okay, we got Santa Anna in the house. That's a big one. Los Al right next door. Daily City, wow, okay. Orange, that's where I'm living, okay. <laughs> Irvine, cool, cool, cool. Welcome, glad you're here. All right, so teaching, but make it pretty. Um, what does that mean? That is um, my way of saying, let's employ some graphic design methods into our teaching. Okay, so our agenda today is what is it and how can we incorporate it into our teaching practices? why we should pay attention to graphic design and how we can do that. So I have three tips, simple tips, and a, a simple method and many, many resources for you. So let's get started with that. Um, anytime you have a question, go ahead and type it into the chat and Angela, feel free to interrupt me at any time. All right. All right, so like I said, I teach seventh and 11th grade history. Um, I would, um, not to be the dog mom I am if I didn't introduce my dog, Dr. Indiana Jones, which you'll see a picture of later on. And again, follow me at EdTechnoStyle. Okay, so what is graphic and media design for the classroom? Simply put, graphic design is the creation of visual content to communicate messages. And as teachers, we do that like 100% of the time. Um, we're always creating worksheets if we were doing things in person. We are creating um, slideshows, we're creating PowerPoints, we're, uh, some of us may be trying to create videos. Um, when we're in person and in our own classroom, we are creating an environment for our students. And so when we think of graphic design, we typically think of like websites and such, but we are graphic designers in, in our own profession as well. There's actually 10 fundamentals of graphic design, um, but what I did was I condensed them, uh, or I rather I, I selected four to really pay attention to that really apply to us being in the classroom or being a, at a school or at a district. And so what those four are, are balance, color, typography, and images. Um, so balance means that how things are distributed in um, some kind of visual that we're presenting. Um, it can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. And so if we just take a look at this slide, everything's very symmetrical, right? Every, there's um, a lot of white space, but everything's kind of evenly spaced out. Um, when we take a look at color, um, we're dictating the mood we, or the tone we want to set. Um, and color often represents our brand, and I'll talk about that today as well. Typography um, is something that I think teachers, including myself, just love. And ty typography has to do with um, the selection of fonts and how we are using them to kind of create the tone or set the mood. Um, and typography, we see typography everywhere, like from advertisements, advertisements on TV and from the font that we select for our students when we're uh, creating student-facing materials. Um, images, we as teachers, we know that images help um, the situation. We, we know that images or pictures um, help our students to understand more. We ask our students to select or to create images um, in certain assignments. And so images are important as well. And so again, there's 10 total fundamentals for graphic design, but I think these four really hit home when it comes to teaching and learning. 
Okay, and so what I'd like us to do is unmute actually, and I want us to talk things out. Um, I want us to apply those four fundamentals of balance, um, images, typography, and color. Okay, so um, I have two example slides that I'm gonna show you. And I want us to think about and just talk it out. How can we improve the following slides? Okay, so this is a, a, a screen grab that I got from a, uh, a presentation. Again, his, history, I follow a lot of history teachers on both Instagram and Twitter. Um, so this was a screen grab I saw. Um, in terms of balance, how do we feel about the balance of um, things we see on the screen? So there's too much text. Mm -hmm. There's too much text, right? And so as history teachers, or for me as a history teacher, I know that sometimes, oh, I need to give them all of this info. Um, other teachers feel that way too, I'm sure. Like, you know, we don't want to use like so many slides, but if um, I was a kid and I saw this, I'd be like, oh my God, like, like what am I looking at here? Because now I have to read this thing, right? Um, what yeah, else? There's, there's what a lot of great stuff in the large. chat. Oh, what was that? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I see here the text box is too large. Title is okay, too right. large compared to the text, the other text. All right. And so then um, a cleaner background, busy background, right? So all of these things are distracting from our message. And our message is going to be our content, what we want the kids to learn. Okay, but um, I agree with you guys too that you know this background is a little bit distracting. Um, I'm focusing on the bricks rather than actually the title. Um, and the title kind of gets hidden into the background. Right, right, Sandra. Um, great adjectives though, like um, the font, the title font is too heavy, okay? And somebody said too harsh, which too was a harsh, good right? descriptor. Okay. And so when we're talking about graphic de design, it's really um, subjective, right? Like it depends on the person on, on what, um, you know, it's very personal, like how, like how we see certain things. It may be different from person to person, from student to student. And so it's kind of hard to gauge everybody or everything. Okay. Um, the, oh, the image is also quite pixelated. Okay, yes, that is very true. Um, so again, that's one of the things we wanna be careful with when we're selecting images. Okay, um, how about this one? Bad font choice. Okay, font choice. Okay. We need, need a better uh, image. Okay, better image. The right. background still detracts from the main idea. Mm -hmm. The background. Yeah, I think universe of obligation is very vague. Um, like it is intuitive after the fact. So after you've probably explained it, that it's unlikely a student will come back to this and be able to recognize it as content. Mm -hmm. Right, and Angela mentioned thinking about access. So remember we're designing for our students who are all different from each other. Um, some of them might be on an IEP or 504. Um, and so maybe we need to think about how we can make this accessible for all of our students. Um, and so that's what graphic design in uh, teaching and learning or graphic design in the classroom is about, making things accessible for our students. Okay, and that brings me to the why, why we do this. Because we need to be able to clearly communicate, especially now where so many of us are virtual, everything is on a screen. Uh, some of us are blended or hybrid. And again, we have so much on the screen. Some of us are concurrent where we have people in person and people at home learning. Um, so, but again, everything is on the screen. And um, in this day and age, when not only are our students learning on the screen, but they are you know, doing everything on a screen, um, things need to be visually engaging for them. So we not only need to communicate our message clearly, 
um, which is what we want them to learn, but we have to make it engaging. They, the students need to engage to be engaged with the material so that it enhances their comprehension and they have a positive experience with whatever it is that they're learning. Okay, so three, th three tips, three simple tips, um, a method and many resources. Okay, number one, keep it simple. I don't know who said that, someone famous, mm -hmm. right? But keep things simple. Um, and you can see here on the slide that I, cre um, I created, um, it's very simple. I'm directly giving you the message. This is num tip number one, keep it simple. And if it, if it was a quote by someone famous, probably there, that's who said it. Er Erica, really quick. Mm -hmm. um, someone mentioned they, they do like the, um, the conversation about visually representing information, but also accommodating students who are absent. So mm -hmm. I mentioned screencasting or sharing lesson slides. I don't know if you have anything else to share. Absolutely. Um, so as a presenter, when we're presenting things like this, um, if we wanna make it accessible for everybody who may be absent or who might not have caught the, the presentation, then that's where, we, where our speaker notes would come in handy. Um, and we would type in and we would type in things that we want to mention. So I have I actually do have like some speaker notes that I have in um, the slides presentation, which you know some of you are already viewing. Um, and if I was doing this for my students, I would type in the speaker notes for the slides. Um, if I was doing things like Pear Decks, which I'll talk about, or Nearpod, or or something similar, um, I'll tell you what I do for that. Oh, sorry. Tip number two is keep it functional, right? So really think about purpose. Um, what is the slide for? What is my what is my materials for? Um, so you know, I've, I'm I'm talking a lot about slides and like PowerPoints type type of things, but really um, you want to think of student facing materials. So when you get back into in person learning, I know I know that I'm not going to be doing everything digitally. I want to go back to paper. Um, you know, digital things are great, but I also see so much value in going back to a, a real, you know, physical book or a physical notebook. I think that's important too. Um, but when you're giving student facing materials or providing student facing materials, um, you know, you need to keep those things functional as well. So what is the purpose of having an image? Is it just to make it look good? Is it just to fill white space? And that's not really a, that's not really functional for learning, um, but being but be intentional about what you're using. Um, this particular slide again, I have a clear message, um, as well as for anybody who joined late, I have the Bitly link there so that they can just type it into their browser um, so that it's accessible to them. And number three, know your audience. Um, so I was practicing this presentation with um, another presenter um, on Thursday night, uh, uh, Christy Flores, and you know I told her like, well, I selected uh, this presentation template uh, because it was simple, okay? But I create I created this template or selected this template because I know that teachers or educators want things kind of quick. You don't need the big text box with paragraphs overflowing. Um, you want things quick to the point and so we can get through it and we can get to the good stuff, which are the resources, the make and takes, the, and so we apply uh, what we've learned about and how we can do that easily. All right, so like I said, um, free, um, a lot of resources. The best things in life are free. So everything I'm sharing with you um, is a free resource. Um, and there are some pro versions available for, for these resources. You can subscribe, but I'm finding that I've, I've not subscribed to any of these, these websites or things that um, I'm going to be showing or sharing with you. And everything is going swimmingly. 
All right, so my favorite sources for themes, um, of course, someone I saw mentioned in the chat slides media, Paula, um, who runs that website, is amazing at creating slides and she uh, kind of crowdsources. So if you've uh, created a, a specific template, that's really great. You can um, send it to her and she'll, she'll put it on the website. Um, there's a lot of slides templates for educators in particular, because I believe Paula um, is, is an educator. Um, but actually, I actually, hold on. I think her daughter is her daughter. Okay. Um, so my favorite actually isn't slides mania though. It's, um, slides go. And the reason why I like slides go, or I prefer slides go, um, is because really this, the search box, this omni box type thing. Um, whereas I find it hard to find things on slides mania, even though the things are, um, even though things are categorized. Uh, this I can search a theme or a color um, as well as um, in slides mania, but um, it just has a better search feature overall. And there's other templates other than just slides. There's infographics, multi-purpose things, um, notebooks and, and the such. So uh, this one is my favorite site to go to. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to these pre-made templates and themes, obviously. It saves us time in having to create. Um, even though like I have this template or you know, um, my classroom is re really decorated really nicely. Um, I, I feel that I'm actually not like super creative. I know how to use tools to help me look creative, but I don't feel like I'm creative. Um, so it saves me time. Um, usually they're very aesthetically pleasing. There's always something for everyone um, and already has fundamental graphic design elements. So you don't have to worry about where to put your text box. Is everything balanced out? Um, are these fonts, uh, good to go, um, or are they too distracting? But some drawbacks um, to this, you can spend too much time looking for that perfect template. I think about my students all the time when um, I ask them to create a slides or, or pick a font, There's they always spend too much time doing those things. Um, so when you're searching for a template or, or um, a temp or a theme, you you want to have something in mind already, something you want to go for. Okay, you want to think of those um, fundamentals of design before you hit those websites. Okay, um, so also these themes that are on the websites, they're not always aesthetically pleasing. Sometimes they can be too busy. Sometimes there's too much color going on. Sometimes um, there's just too much going on in the slide. Okay, and they're not always conducive to um, interactive slides. So maybe you're using, maybe you're creating hyper slides or hyper docs. Sometimes templates aren't going to be conducive to that. Um, I use Pear Deck every day. Uh, some people use Nearpod. Um, it's not going to be, con it, they're not always going to be conducive to that. So those are things to watch out for when you select your theme or template. Okay, so for simple graphics and images, um, my favorite thing to use this year has been Flat Icon. Um, I know that a lot of people use another one called the Noun Project, but I find Flat Icon um, kind of easier to use. Um, it's the largest database of icons in the world, and they have a Google Slides add-on that you can use. And so you can see the this link um, icon that I've been using today. Uh, that's from um, flat icon, and then unsplash. This is flat icon, and then unsplash is for uh, free images. They're pretty much stock images. So if you're looking for just a visual, something eye catchy, um, you know, for for just a regular presentation, then this is something that you can use. Um, obviously, if you're looking for something for your content, you'll want a different type of image. Um, you can still search um, on Splash for those images, but um, typically 
because I teach history, I want it to relate to a particular event. So, so Unsplash would not work for that. Right, so using fonts to engage. Um, again, I mentioned the students who love using fonts, right? They, they um, have, can spend a whole class period on using fonts um, or picking a font for whatever assignment they have. So, you know, even though they've get, been given the freedom to do that, when you're creating the materials for them, it's really important to um, make sure that the fonts are easy, easy to read as we did some analysis in those other slides, right? And also to make sure they kind of go together. Not just because you like the font doesn't always just because you like the font doesn't always mean it's going to go to go with another font that you like, and that's kind of where my students fall off the track. They they see two fonts or three fonts or five fonts that they love, and they put it all together on one slide, right? So you want to revert back, and you want to make sure that you're using um, no more then I would say three fonts maximum on a particular slide. And you wanna select how you're using them. So, you know, for this slide example, um, for I used one particular font for the heading and then um, one font for the main text or the body. Okay, so then again, it's not distracting from main message. Um, so for font pair, font pair, um, gives us featured uh, featured font pairs that we can employ into our materials and gives us the example like this could be the heading and then this could be the body text. And you can do a search by font type sans serif versus serif sans serif meaning no to little tail end on the font. This is a serif font because it has a little tear f tear, um, tail end there. Um, displays, um, serif, serif font, um, and some other type of fonts. But you can out, you know, these are terms for uh, graphic designers. I, I honestly only know what sans serif versus serif is. Um, but it gives us more to look at and to, and to select from, and to give us an idea of what would be good to use and what not. Um, this is a font pairing site as well. Um, it's called Font Joy, and you can use it to um, select uh, two fonts to see if they go together, or three fonts, and see if they go together. And then in that same slide um, is a non designer's gu guide to pairing fonts. And so this um, designer gives us some kind of tips to go about when selecting what fonts to use, or not what fonts to use, but how to use them, I should say. And so um, here's a tip, combine serif with sans serif, um, avoid similar classifications. So these two are similar classifications of fonts, whereas these two are not. Uh, we have uh, contrast and font size, like a, heading, a large heading, and then the body. And also weights, using bold or not. And then different roles, like I said, using one for a heading or one for a subheading and then one for the body. Uh, this one is a clear example of like the student, right? How, who wants to have um, these two fonts, but they don't necessarily go together in terms of mood. Okay, and the fonts are really pretty important because that's what is giving the message to the students. Um, so selecting fonts is a lot more important than we think sometimes. Okay, and thinking about things also, we wanna employ color theory. Okay, and employing color theory means when we select colors for our um, presentations or um, art that we're showing the students, uh, our student facing materials. Um, if we're using color, we need to really be intentional about that even. Um, I tend to use a lot of muted colors with my content. 
um, because I want my students to feel calm when they see a primary source document and they have to analyze it. Um, when I, for my current unit for my seventh grade students is on China though. And so I know that red is a very important color, but I had to think about, well, do I wanna use red because red can sometimes signify love, which is great, but red can also signify anger um, or excitedness. And so I had to be, I had to think about like what, why am I gonna use this color? Um, here's a guide again for color theory and it's a non-designer's guide um, about what colors we can or what colors to select and possibly not select depending on our audience, our mood, what tone we wanna uh, project to the student. Okay, once we select our mood though, sometimes we can have um, an issue about selecting other colors that go together. And so Color Hunt and Coolers, these two websites are great for creating color palettes. So Coolers in particular has a feature where you can um, select a photo image and it'll create a it'll create a color palette based on that photo. So if you're um, you know, one of my friends from another middle school was um, going to have her students read and analyze the poem by Amanda Gorman, The Hill We Climb. And there's a beautiful, vibrant picture of her uh, wearing the yellow coat and um, having, you know, a red scarf and blue. She was very, she um, was extremely colorful at the inauguration. Um, and so she uploaded that picture to this website and it created the color palette and, and the hex code for each of those colors so she can employ those into the slides that she was creating. Uh, Erica, really quick. Um, I don't know if you know, but somebody asked about the fonts, mm -hmm. um, if those are downloadable through like iPad, if students are using iPads, if they're able to access those fonts as well. It depends on what App they're using on the iPad. So if they're using Google on the iPad, um, they can sign into hopefully um, a desktop. But um, when you're in the font or when you're in your text and you select the font, there's um, a selection that at the very top, it says more fonts. And you can add those to the list that you want. So you can see all the ones that are not checked off for me. Not because I don't like them, but because I didn't find I, I just haven't found use to the use for them. Um, but there's a ton of them that you can select to add to your list of, of the ones that you want to go, what you want to use. Um, you can select by script type. Um, you can see all the different um, st styles or the show, and you can sort them. So if you see a particular font. Um, that you like and you know the name of it. You can just go alphabetical. Um, you can see what's trending even, uh, what people are choosing for whatever reason. And then when you select it, it gives you a check mark and it adds it to your list. You can even remove fonts that you're, you know, that you're just not going to use. And so that's how we select fonts for Google. Um, you know, I was once a, um, a Microsoft Word user. And so that one is a little bit easier because you can just search free fonts and there's tons of websites, download it into, um, into your hard drive and then it, it just gets into your PowerPoint or document. Um, same thing with using Apple on the desktop or laptop. You can download free fonts that way as well. All right, so here um, I mentioned in my description about creating a brand. Um, so a brand gives the audience a focus um, and it gives your, it gives clarity to your audience. So about like who you are, um, it gives 
uh, or evokes emotions and connect, encourages connections. So think about like, if I were to use this type of slides in all of my presentations, everybody would, would recognize like, oh, this must be an Erica presentation because um, it looks really similar to her style. Um, and it, it gives us recognition, it's consistent, and it makes students feel more at ease with the material. Now, instead of creating everything from scratch though, um, Canva is just amazing with educators. Um, if you sign up for Canva for education, you get all the pro features for free. So if you've been using Canva for free, uh, but you didn't sign up specifically as an educator, and that doesn't mean like with like there's a there's a form um, that you fill in on Canva saying that you're an educator, um, then you can get all of the pro features for free, which gives you animations and all of the templates and all of the icons and images, just everything, and so. Um, I highly recommend you sign up for Canva for education if you haven't already. Um, Canva is great for education because not only is it free, but they've um, started, I think, I want to say it was the summer where they started doing more things for education. So they have uh, templates specifically for education um, with presentations, infographics, which um, my students actually used um, the, other, the other week for one of for their final project. Uh, there's worksheets even that you can download and they can use digitally okay, for different subject matters, flashcards, um, Google Classroom headers, which um, I do need to mention that they integrate with Google Classroom. And so you can upload your class into Canva, um, assign them something, and then uh, they start creating. Even lesson plans, if you if you want to have like a you know a visual lesson plan, maybe you're being observed and you want to give, give your principal or supervisor something really nice to look at. Um, class schedules, which is great to for to create for students, um, as well as they can create it themselves. Uh, kind of give them some agency on that. Okay. And so then you can see all of these different templates just for education. All right, so um, one of the things that I wanted to show was to about creating a brand was this icon key. So uh, this is something that I started using with my students um, in um, the fall uh, to, so that they can recognize things that I want them to do or things that I want them to focus on for the class. And so these are Typically the eight icons I use on a, on a regular basis. It's not daily, but definitely every week um, I'll be using some of these icons. Um, and so this gives me that branding with them when they see icons, you know, that's Miss Aguirre stuff. Um, I know that when I see, I, or when the, when the students see the icons, they know that, okay, this is important. I gotta remember this. Or when they see these icons, I don't even have to, uh, because, with history, there's a lot of cause and effect. Um, when they see these icons, they know right away, okay, this is the cause, that's the effect. Um, when they see the highlighter, they know to highlight now. They And when they see the link, they know it's an active link that they need to click to use uh, for information. These two icons, uh, group work and uh, making thinking visible. So um, my, my school is an, my, my schools are avid schools, and so that's kind of a big a big deal. Making your thinking vi visible, it's um, a critical reading strategy. So using annotations, and, and so when um, you know a lot of students seem to think just annotating means just highlighting, um, and so I don't want them to highlight. And, and I tell them all the time, I want to see your thinking. And so when I say that now, and I use the icon, they're like, oh, okay, now I have to explain why I highlighted this particular thing. And so uh, that's kind of how I'm going about branding for myself with my students. Okay. And so I have the rest of the time um, to answer any questions, see if I can help with anything for you to play with the websites that I've uh, shared with you. And that's it.
Awesome. So we do have about 10 minutes. And um, the, the, if you look at the schedule, the schedule has been updated with our times. We are still going to end the day at the same time. Um, just breaks and lunches have just been adjusted. And then um, with this session ending around 1115, that'll give you like a 10 minute leeway to get ready for session two. So definitely if you wanna unmute or ask Erica any questions, um, this was amazing. And I think I mentioned like, this is even great for utilizing with your students. Cause I'm sure a lot of us are trying to um, teach our students how to create digital presentations if we hadn't done so already. Um, so I think these are great key characteristics for us to even pass on with our students too. Okay, so I saw a question already in the chat about using Canva. Uh, Canva is really user friendly, in my opinion, um, for um, doing anything graphically. Um, so I have all my designs here. If I want to just start with a template, like if um, for my students, I assign them to create a public service announcement, and two of those choices included an infographic or um, a social media post. And so some of them selected Instagram posts and I gave them a blank template. Um, but on the left side, you can select what you'd like that template to kind of look like in formatting. It doesn't necessarily mean like you're gonna, you know, be stuck with a picture of some random children, but you can, <laughs> you're gonna wanna replace that. Um, you're gonna wanna replace the text. So they know that these are templates that they're gonna kind of fill in the blank, which is really great because, um, I don't know, a few years ago when infographics started being the thing, I asked my students to create them kind of like on the fly. And I just, it, it, you know, it was just all wonky. Was the information there? Yeah, but I had to really search for it because it wasn't employing the fundamentals of graphic design. In this way, students are kind of learning the fundamentals of graphic design in the background as they're, as they're applying the content. How do you use the different colors? Ah, that's awesome. All right, so if I wanted to change the color of this text, for example, then I would go into the text color and it gives me some choices, but then I, want, I don't want that color. So I would go to color theory or, um, sorry, I would go into color hunt and find the hex color and I'd copy it and go back to Canva where my design is. Click new color, I paste that hex color in there. So this is a far, far cry from when I started knowing just even a little bit about hex colors. I, you know, I'm a born in the 80s, raised in the 90s kind of girl. And um, I remember making my first websites about my favorite band. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make a website about my favorite band. And so using HTML code and, you know, guessing what colors, guessing the codes, like you, you know, having that in the, having to do that in the nineties is really hard. Now it's just all there for me. And I don't have to know that code. Hands on webinar on how to use Canva. <laughs> so that might be your next one, just the Canva one. Part two. All right. <laughs> and then Kevin said, I don't know if you saw, but he says it's nice to see someone present present. I'm actually on. happy that Kevin's in here because I was, I'm I'm a big fan of your work. <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask Erica? And I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask anyway. Have you had any professional training on graphic design, or is this just from your own interest? This is from my own interest. I figured. So, you know, my session title is Teach But Make It Pretty. I just like pretty things. <laughs> and I agree, Erica. I could totally, like, empathize with you when you were talking about this, because it's like, I, I feel like I'm good at using the tools but that creative piece when it comes to digital, like mm -hmm. I struggle with that. And so I was like, oh, this feels so good to hear somebody else say. <laughs> my favorite fonts. Uh, my favorite fonts 
it I don't actually don't have, well I guess Helvetica that's pretty like standard and boring but like um you know I I like I like a lot of sans serif fonts I think they're personally uh, more clear to read um and I think that it it's still very it's very modern um and I don't know I, I just don't I'm not a fan of like serif fonts like Times New Roman. I know that, like that's MLA format, which we have, you know, we have to teach our kids in ABC. Um, but, you know, there are, there are, you can use actually Helvetica in your MLA formatting. So, um, but I, I tell the kids, you know, use Times New Roman because um, that's what their high, you know, high school teacher, because I'm also a high school teacher. Um, that's what we'll use in, you know, at GAR or Times New Roman. And also, you know, if they move on to college. Ah, yearbook. I was in the yearbook staff for two years in the high school. So perhaps maybe that's where, you know, my love of pretty fonts started. <laughs> Probably with YM Magazine in 17. <laughs> so we do want to be mindful of everybody's time. So there's about four more minutes of this session. And then again, a 10 minute leeway to make sure you choose your next session and all the times have been updated in um, the session schedule as well. All right, everybody, I don't wanna hold you up any longer. So you may stick around if you didn't have any questions, but I do want you to take your breaks like I want my students to um, and have a good one. So happy you were you're here today. Thank you. Yeah, if anybody has, um, um, Erica, really quick, somebody says is, um, Let's see, can you edit a template in Canva and then share it with students? Yes, you can. Okay, I, that was me. I was like, I wanna make, have them make an infographic. So if I kind of like, you know, helped them know what I want where, then I could share that template. And did they do it in Canva or do they do it like in Google Slides or do they, they do it in to? Canva? And at, um, our, I'm a, I just signed up for the Canva for educators, but do the kids have to have a certain kind of account or? Anybody can do that. If you upload your class, if you're use, if you're a Google Classroom user, huh? you can upload your class and they're set to go. Oh, really? Then you just share it through Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's easy. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. Please, please, please have a workshop on Can Canva. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I Erica, I'll do my best, I guess. <laughs> Erica, we can talk later, maybe do something through Q for one of our play dates. Oh yeah, for sure. We can just change the breakout room. Yeah, I believe you can just go into the next breakout room or choose the next breakout room. They might, they'll probably, I don't, I don't know if they have the uh, waiting room available or not, but you should just be able to transfer over to a new one. Does anybody know how to update their code or update the uh, breakout room in order to move? If I'm not seeing the um, things at the bottom of it? Um, you would just leave the room, go back to the main room, and then choose the next breakout room. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And hi, Neelan. I've been emailing you. That's me. <laughs> Ma'am, thank you so much. I'm so sorry. My email is so swamped. I get it. I totally <laughs> get so it. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. <laughs> me too. I'm so excited. And then, um, Erica, in order to stop the recording, I guess, and have it download, and I apologize that you have to do that, um, but you'll have to, like, completely leave, I guess. Oh, okay. I did stop yeah. the recording, but I haven't left, obviously. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess you'll have to leave, and then, unfortunately, you'll have to, like, rejoin our main room. Okay. Okay. All right, everybody. Um, we will see you, and thank you, Erica. That was wonderful. Nice seeing you, Angela. Nice seeing you. Yes, everybody. you too. <laughs> <laughs>
Listen, if you've been a middle school teacher for quite some time, everything, everything. can become dirty, yeah, okay? No, Anything and everything. It's 